I found that last rare finish. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today, we're taking you back to the 70s and talking about a model that Santana endorsed as well as Aldi Miola. Some people call it the flattened Les Paul Pancake, but its official title is the Gibson L6S. However, the one that we're documenting today is a little bit different from the full-on one. This is the slightly stripped back Midnight Special version in that final limited edition finish that we haven't documented yet. This one is known as Glitter White. Sometimes you'll see people refer to it as Cream Sparkle because they do yellow and turn a creamy color with age, but it basically just has a glitter in the clear coat on these that makes them a little bit fancier. But to learn more about these freaky string through flat guitars, let's dive into a history lesson. So in 1972, Gibson introduced this weird thing. This is known as an L5S. It was basically a Gibson L5, but created in a solid body format. So you didn't have to worry about any feedback. You can have all the electric stuff that you want. You can check out this full review and demo to learn a little bit more about this particularly interesting one. So the year after that, we had the introduction of this model, the L6S. Now they might have similar names, but they're constructed very differently. Basically, that's where the similarities end. They both look like flattened pancake Les Pauls. <laughs> So the year after the L5S introduction, they came out with the L6S. So I suppose you could look at these as a kind of stripped down version of that. However, it's not super ultra low end. So the very first year of L6S production, they looked like this. The first 200 or so got pretty cool block inlays and then they switched them over into dots, which is what you will see on pretty much everything. But the year following that, they decided to introduce a deluxe model. And then at that time, the L6S was renamed the L6S Custom because these were a Bill Lawrence collaboration. These pickups right here, they were designed by him. Now the custom might look like it has two volumes and a tone and some sort of a veritone switch on it. However, it's actually a master volume with a mid roll off as well as a treble roll off. And then your chicken head rotary knob here acts very similar to a veritone. You can get a whole bunch of different tones. But this new deluxe was completely different. It had a string through body design. It had a radically different pick guard. It didn't have a veritone. I believe it still had the same pickups, but it had a regular selector switch on it. And then just a master volume and a regular tone. So those were the main models of the L6S and they lasted until the early 80s. However, there was another model within this family that kind of blent the two specs together. This is known as the L6 Midnight Special. For whatever reason, it did not have the S in the title officially. And these were a little bit more stripped down and named after a TV show that was popular at the time. So what do I mean by stripped down? They're actually bolt-on necks. And as far as I can tell, this is the very first Gibson bolt-on neck guitar that is a solid body electric. So we kind of have the deluxe layout here as far as it being a string through design. We still have the Bill Lawrence pickups, but besides being a bolt-on neck, the other unique feature here is we actually have a plain Gibson headstock. But of the Midnight Specials, the coolest ones have to be the sparklies. So you can find Burgundy, which we had documented in this episode right here. And then we have this one that we're talking about today known as Glitter White. So naturally, 70s guitar with sparkle finish, yeah, it's going to be collectible today. But surprisingly, these don't sell for crazy premiums. It's not like the Sparkle Top Deluxe that sell for 10 grand plus nowadays, whereas a regular Deluxe is like three or four. I mean, there still is a premium associated with these, but it's not as big as you might think. Now, unfortunately, this one's not as clean as I usually collect, but I got such a good deal on it, I figure we might as well document it while it's here. And when I find a cleaner one, I'll swap this one out in my collection. But I also wanted to document it because the pick guard style is a little bit different. In our Sparkle Burgundy episode, we saw this interesting clear one that looked more similar to the deluxe model. Most times you don't have this one on the Midnight Specials. You have this style. It's kind of strange looking, but familiar at the same time as far as these jazzy arch tops go. But hey, now we can see both of the glitter finishes together and the two pick guard styles. Which one do you guys prefer? I think I like the clear one because it shows off the glitter better. So if you're a collector, there are quite a few of these to get. Because even the regular L6S, they came in so many different iterations. There's a lot of colors. You could find every single fretboard imaginable on that model. I mean, the Midnight Specials, you could only find them in maple. As far as the custom goes, you could find it with an ebony board. You could find it with a rosewood as well as maple. So that's something else that makes these kind of unique. A maple fretboard on a Gibson. This was very new at the time as far as being mass produced. So to learn more about this unique L6 Midnight Special, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs. Ow, 
Ouch, I got scammed on this one. Advertised as all original and unfortunately no. So the first thing that kind of tipped me off here is our pickup rings are on backwards. So normally the big thick side goes towards the back, whereas this is opposite. So I was thinking that maybe I should switch those around, but if you remember, you gotta be very, very, very extra careful with L6 pickups. They have these very thin wires, and if you so as much lightly tug them, they just break. So I very carefully removed our neck pickup. Everything was looking good. All right. But I noticed the aging to this cover looked like this. But then I went over here and it's like, oh, that looks very new. And it looks like somebody intentionally just took a nail and started scratching it to try to match it. And sure enough, yank this thing out. Seymour Duncan, that's a big bummer. We've got an SH4 in the bridge. That's an awesome pickup, but not exactly what it was advertised as. Thankfully, these pickups get parted out all the time. They're worth about 200 bucks a piece, so it is possible to restore this, but I prefer to have completely stock original examples. So our replaced bridge pickup's pretty hot, 16K ohms, neck position, 5.98, and let's see how they play together, 4.41. Hey, it's Strogly from the future here. So I went to do the playing demo of this, the neck pickup wasn't working. I was like, ah, oh, no, did I break it or is this additional scamage? And it ended up noticing something about that pickup. It had already been broken once before, but thankfully it didn't break clean off. They had just enough that they could solder it back together. And the same thing happened right here. They had to splice that back in there. So this was shorting out against this leg here. Sometimes if you would set the pickup down, it would work. Other times it wouldn't. So if I'm going to move this onto the next home, I want to make sure that it's going to work. So I found out this was just a bad connection. So I'm going to go ahead and solder these back together. That seems to have done the trick. But here we can take a look inside our pickup cavities. Everything's looking the way we would normally see. And here's our bridge pickup cavity one. And unfortunately, the plastics are getting very fragile on this early 70s guitar. So it's chipped right here. More evidence of chipped plastic right here on our back plate. And while I was cleaning, the darn tip of the pick guard snapped off. I'm not sure, maybe it was just already like that and somebody put it there in place and that's why it came off when I was polishing. But that is very common on these pick guards. But here's a good color compare of how it started new versus how it's going now. It has definitely discolored over the ages. And before I took this apart, I decided, you know, strum a couple of chords, see how it's playing. And uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of buzzing in the middle of the neck. So I did a quick sight. It looks like there might be a twist to the neck. Hopefully I can still set it up okay. More on that after I get it all strung up and do a slight setup to it. But the reason I bring that up is I wanted to adjust the action to see if that's just all that it needed. And this is what I always warn you guys about on harmonica bridges, which are these things. They're really wide travel bridges that briefly existed in Gibson history from the early 70s till about the early 80s, give or take. I've never actually seen one with the Made in West Germany branding, though. Usually it's Made in Germany over here, kind of slightly impressed or nothing at all. But then this is a string through guitar, which is pretty cool. I still gave this a full polish job and the glitter flake in the finish just really came to life because all the light can reflect upon it. So this is a lot more exciting to look at now. As far as our controls, three-way toggle switch, master volume, master tone. It's not like the full-on L6S that has the rotary switch. You can do a whole bunch of other stuff. And we've got our output jack on the front. This has a maple body, we'll see that on the back side, but we can move on to our maple neck with our maple fretboard with our 24 frets. This was one of the earliest 24 fret Gibsons in the electric solid body world anyways. You can see you've got lots of finish wear up and down the fretboard, even more so now that I've cleaned it. And you see this area of the finish, how it's kind of splintered a bit? That's one of two things. A, humidity damage, which I think is the case, which is also why the neck pry has a warp to it. Or it could be from a refret, but if it was from a refret, I think we would see it everywhere rather than just in one certain area. You'll also see right here where the fretboard has slightly shrank. You can see that line. That's just where the neck kind of stands proud. It's possible it left the factory like that, but probably more so due to humidity issues would be my guess. The frets definitely show some wear. They could use a level recrown depending on how picky you are with playing. We've got a 24 3 quarter inch scale length, but these guys got pretty skinny nuts, 1.57 inches. And by the 12th, it's just barely two. First fret neck up 0.83. And it says 0.97 by the 12th. Now, if you take that as it's gonna be super big and chunky, it just maintains a really roundedness. Like it does get bigger here, but since the neck is so small in width, it, it doesn't feel like your usual like R7, R8 baseball bat neck. Here you can see that on the contour gauge. Tiny first fret, huge big wide 12th fret. Very different profiles as you go up. 
So it starts small and skinny, but it gets a little bit chunkier and gets wider. Now we move on to our headstock. You can see how much it's yellowed by looking at what was hiding underneath the truss rod cover, but I am shocked. Most of these do not have a three screw truss rod cover. I was fully well expecting this to have been a replaced aftermarket part that was maybe stolen off of like a lawsuit era one, but no, because if it had a normal one, you would see another hole right there. And our truss rod is good and functioning. And then even though these tuners look 100% correct, unfortunately they are replacements. A, they function way too good to be the original tuners. And B, you can see some holes around them. I'll show you more of that on the back side of the headstock. Flipping over to the back side, let's take a look at our control cavity. Okay, so it's this wire that made me go, huh, what's going on here? Now, I had laser focused on these small ones thinking, okay, well, maybe something was just touched up and they put a different pickup in here. But what I should have been focusing on is this big black wire because that is definitely not correct. It should look like these small wires coming through. But hey, we've got early 1975 pop codes. So those are still original and everything else looks okay in here to me. So it'd be pretty easy to swap it back to how it left the factory. You just have some soldering work evidence. The rest of the body, you've got lots of nicks and dings around out here so this was used quite a bit to gig with that's for sure the worst area is definitely over here he must have had a strap that had like some metal buckle on it or something it just really chewed through the finish up here and here you can very clearly see the maple body but surprisingly no neck pocket cracks just a couple of finish checks right there And then our next finish is really worn down but it's been polished to be nice and smooth now we've got a pretty nasty gouge right here Looks like it might have been attempted to have been touched up. And now we're tuners. A keen eye will see what I saw. Huh, there's like a small hole on the edge of some of these. So if you go ahead and remove your tuners, you can see what happened here. The original tuners on these things, they don't stand the test of time, so people will replace them. So it looks like what was available to somebody was one of those really cheap, nasty sets of tuners that you find on an import model. Because that's what those holes line up with. But then somebody bought a modern day reproduction of what originally came on here. Which just so happens to almost cover over all the holes. Honestly, with the rest of this guitar being player grade at this point, that's the set of tuners you want on here. Alright, got it all strung back up. So good news and bad news. The good news is relative buzz freeless playability now. It might be that the radius of the bridge has slightly been squashed because you really only get buzzing on the G string and then you get a little bit on the high E right now. But if you set your bridge up at a drastic tilt like that, everything seems to play okay. Although I'd make the argument that the action could be better. But unfortunately, yeah, there's definitely a twist in this neck. I think it's mainly in the headstock, but you can see it definitely continues, but it's hard to show that on camera. The good news is the body's the most expensive thing about this thing, having the glare white finish. So you could technically buy a donor neck, slap it on here, and then you'd be good to go. So it's not like a normal set neck where that's either a death sentence or you just have to play it as is or refret it with the twist in mind. Moving on to our black light test, the finish is glowing very evenly, but you can see some nicks and dings going through to the wood that we were looking at earlier. This just helps them stand out a little bit more for you, but those are definitely our original knobs. And this test will also help you see all the lacquer wear on our fretboard. You definitely did a lot of playing in that area, and our headstock is actually looking pretty clean. But here's some interesting stuff. It glows a little bit differently right there. I would imagine that was a reaction to some sort of a strap that was left on here because it kind of follows that pattern or something spilled on it. It doesn't look like a touch up to me, but here's some areas where the finish had been worn. Now that right there is a touch up. It looks like we might have another small one right here and we can see all of our other dings. And yes, there is definitely some sort of a touch up attempt right here on the neck, just not a very good one. But there you can see what I was talking about earlier, how it's going to glow a little bit differently. So there's the bright yellowish green, but on the neck it's a little bit less because it's been played down. Looks like maybe you in a bit of stand rash. At least we don't have any brakes, cracks, or repairs back here. So yeah, that was a bit of a bummer workbench segment, but oh well. It weighs 7 pounds, 12.7 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds.
I really like this neck pickup. It works great. It's got that very clear, chimey vintage tone. <laughs> And then the bridge has that modernness that's not quite as chimey. And then the middle, I think, was accidentally wired out of phase, but it kind of works. In fact, I would actually say I really enjoy that out of phase sound. Now, if you're not a big fan of these being out of phase, you just have to flip the magnets in the bridge humbucker, and I think that would solve that. However, these are known for being musically diverse, so I'm not gonna mess with that. Now, let's kick on the dirt. <laughs> I can see why this one was played. It's probably the best midnight special I've had. No, despite the twist in the neck, I mean, it's not the lowest action in the world, but it's far from the worst. But the other thing to know is this SH4 is extremely microphonic, which is both a good and bad thing. That's what the squeal is. The way to fix that is you need to wax pot it, but then sometimes you lose the nitty grittiness. <laughs> Now that we know all about the glitter white finish of the L6 Midnight Special, what are my final thoughts on this thing? This was a big can of worms. I bit off more than I thought I was ready to chew, but hey, we got it all up and running. It's cleaned up, it's beautiful, but thankfully it still plays and sounds pretty darn good. So now I'm kind of conflicted because at first I thought, okay, it's a little bit beat up. I'll keep it in my personal collection until I find a cleaner one. And then when I found the twisted neck, it's like, okay, I don't need to hold this thing back. But now that it plays good, it's like, oh, okay, I'm conflicted. So. I think I'll put it up for sale and hopefully this video will help me find a slightly cleaner condition one. But it just goes to show you, just because a neck is twisted doesn't necessarily make it a death sentence for the guitar. Some twists can actually be beneficial and give you lower action on the higher strings, but that is not always the case. I only bring it up because it's a case by case basis. But if a shop is advertising a neck as twisted, first off, good on them because most people just hide it and hope you don't notice. But maybe go give it a try because not all twisted necks are exactly the same. But all right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed documenting this other rare finish of the L6 Midnight Special. I think I'm done documenting these because I've done all the cool finishes unless we find something else, but we definitely still need to document an L6S Deluxe. So until then, I will see you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.
If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.